Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. Matthew's drinking, uh, I'm Mike Brown, and, uh... I'm drinking a coffee with, like, a little illustration of the queen on it, and Mike was like, is that Snoop Dogg? (laughs) I thought it was Snoop Dogg. It, like, it's really funny. I think you've been doing too much of what Snoop Dogg used to be doing. He recently said he's not smoking pot anymore. Well, no, I haven't smoked pot in over 30 years, so... (laughs) Okay, then it's it's just your eyesight. It's probably just my eyesight, or my brain. (laughs) brain it could be my brain so how are you matthew 10 out of 10 how are you michael i am not too shabby thank you excellent this is a wild story we're doing today yeah let's get into it the views information and opinions expressed during the dark poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of curious cast its affiliate global news nor its parent company chorus entertainment Dark poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. On the afternoon of December 20th, 1974, a storekeeper in the Ramsey neighborhood of Calgary, Alberta, alerted the police about a customer. His name was Philip Laurier Gagnon, 26. He'd become aggressive after being denied the sale of airplane glue. The individual fled, and police pursued him to his residence two blocks away. When officers approached the suspect's home and entered, they were met with gunfire. Additional police, more than 130 officers, arrived to find the suspect armed with two automatic rifles in the converted garage. Gagnon refused to come out. A shootout ensued, resulting in the death of Detective Boyd Davidson, 43, from a gunshot wound to the neck. Six other officers were wounded by gunfire, and several others were injured. After a military armored car arrived, police gained the upper hand, smashed into the house, and dislodged a gunman from his hideout. Gagnon, who had two rape convictions and a history of assault as well as a record of mental illness and drug abuse, also died at the scene in a hail of bullets as he charged at the officers firing. Detective Davidson, a 23-year veteran of the police force and a key figure in establishing the combined police and fire arson squad, left behind a wife and five children. His death and what was learned from the events led to the creation of the Calgary Police Service's tactical team and changes to policing nationwide. This is Dark Poutine episode 295, The Black Friday Siege, The Murder of Detective Boyd Davidson. Thank you to Yumber Yard member Trish Tipkowski for suggesting this case. The minute I started reading about it, I was like, what in the heck? Black Friday typically refers to the day following Thanksgiving Day in the United States, which is celebrated on the fourth Thursday of November. Traditionally, Black Friday marks the beginning of the Christmas shopping season in the United States. And the term is also leaked across the border here, as do those Black Friday deals. So 
Hey, how about a little bit of word wanderlust with Matthew now? Mike? Sure, sure. I know, <laughs> I know you're thinking about uh, per- pursuing that in a way. So Black Friday, really interesting. The first recorded use of the term Black Friday had nothing to do with shopping at all. It was a, the description given by newspapers for the crash of the U.S. gold market back in 1869. Mm-hmm. when two chancers tried to buy up as much of the country's gold as they could to drive up the prices. And when the plot was uncovered, the market crashed and bankrupted like everybody. Sounds like something that would happen today. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? The second use uh, was actually from a journal called, sounds like a good read, Factory Management and Maintenance. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I just fell asleep during that. A vigorous read. Oh, my. In 1951, uh, the term was used in that magazine um, f- to refer to the practice of workers calling in sick on the day after American Thanksgiving so they could have a four-day weekend. I, I kind of like, yeah, I kind of like that one, right? Yeah. One of the most common things that people think what it means is that if you're a retailer, and you're you're in the red for the most of the year, and if you're not in the black by the end of Thanksgiving weekend, you're not gonna you're not gonna make it. Oh wow! But the real history in terms of shopping was back in the fifties. Police in Philadelphia used the term to describe the chaos that ensued on the day after Thanksgiving when hordes of suburban shoppers and tourists came into the city for a big Army Navy football game. Yep. So the Philly cops weren't allowed to take the day off. They, they had extra long shifts and they had, you know, their shoplifters taking advantage of the bedlam and, and the cops called it Black Friday. So that's a little bit of a history of, of the term Black Friday. Well, there we go. So let's get back to this story. <laughs> the, <laughs> the first officer assigned to what should have been a routine call that day was Constable Harvey Gregorash. At 1.14 p.m., he received a dispatch call because a man had been coming into a local grocery store buying multiple tubes of model airplane glue each time. And when the store clerk refused to sell the clearly intoxicated man any more glue, he became irate and threatened her. She subsequently called police. Uh, Rose de Mulinaire proprietor at Ideal Grocery at 8th Street and 11th Avenue Southeast, was well-liked by local kids who called her by her first name when they went to buy candy and comic books. That Friday afternoon was typical. The kids were out of school on their Christmas holidays, so a few were in Rose's store when Philippe Laurier Gagnon, a man she'd served several times, came into the store wanting six more tubes of model airplane glue. He'd bought 27 that week alone. And Rose had had enough. She knew no one was building that many models to require that much glue in that amount of time. She suspected that if Gagnon wasn't using it all for himself to get high on, perhaps he was giving it to local kids. She wanted no part in that kind of thing, so she refused to serve him. Hey, when you were a kid, did your local store have signs saying that airplane model glue could only be purchased if your parents were with you? I think that Zellers had a sign like that. It's a long time ago. I did build models. My dad and I actually built models together, but I do remember that sign at least being in Zellers. And uh, if you're uh, Generation X or below, you you remember what Zellers was. (laughs) Yeah, and and what airplane models are. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I I can remember I built a few airplanes, but my favorite was... uh, R2-D2. Oh, okay, that's cool. Yeah. Rose later told the Calgary Herald, quote, He was behaving radical inwardly. He was trying to coerce me into being a consistent seller of that which he desired, glue. Rose declined to state the specific threat that Gagnon made. However, she did say that he was, quote, emoting in a highly tense state. She continued, quote, It wasn't as if he grabbed me, but the minute I showed any hesitation to his demand, he mouthed it. End quote. And Rose sounds like an interesting person. And don't you think she speaks like the Dowager Countess of Grantham in Downtown Abbey? Downtown Abbey. <laughs> I do kind of think that she she speaks that way. I wonder why someone like that, someone with that sort of level of conversation is a store owner, like a corner store owner. It's fascinating. It, it, yeah. I would love to know Rose's story, more about who she was. <laughs> hey, if, if anyone listening knows Rose, just give us a call. Or new yeah. Rose, give us a call. 
Yeah, I figure she is probably gone by now. Yeah. But Philippe Gagnon had lived in the converted garage in the Blue House at 1034 Ninth Street Southeast for only 36 days at the time of the incident, having moved in on November 15th. Gagnon's neighbors had barely any time to take notice of him, and those who met him said he seemed nice enough and had introduced himself as Phil. So I looked up this address on Google Maps because I'm nosy that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you see this leafy green residential street, and it's hard to imagine the story we're about to tell that takes place here. Yeah. Because it's just, it looks, you know, peaceful sort of residential street. Yeah, it looks kind of like the street I grew up on kind of thing. Yeah. In the Calgary Herald, his landlady, Mrs. David Shores, said, quote, As far as we, she and her husband, knew, he was just a normal guy who wanted a place to live near work. I was amazed when I heard what was going on. I couldn't see how it could have started. And we sure had no idea that he had an arsenal in there, end quote. Gagnon told his landlords that he worked for Pinecrest Poultry Sales Limited at 2126 Hearst Road Southeast, just a short drive from his home. But there was a lot about him that they didn't know. He had a long history of criminal behavior, drug addiction, and mental illness. According to the Calgary Herald, quote, records from the Alberta Hospital Edmonton indicate that Gagnon was involuntarily admitted to the psychiatric facility on two occasions once in 1967 and again in 1971, following the authorization by doctors. His admissions were short-lived, lasting only two days in 67 and a week in 1971. The specific reasons for these admissions were not disclosed by the hospital's admissions office. According to an article by Mike DeMore of the Western Standard, born in 1948, Gagnon was raised on a farm near Edmonton and was estranged from his family in his late teens. He hated being told what to do and when to do it, and dropped out of school early. At 20, Gagnon had his first significant encounter with the law, arrested for creating a public disturbance. By 23, he had escalated to more severe crimes, earning a three-year prison sentence for two rape charges and one assault. In prison, he was identified as harboring intense hostility toward authorities and potentially being a sociopath, according to a prison psychologist. Despite traits that might align him with other prisoners, Gagnon's status as a convicted sex offender made his prison life difficult. Labeled as a skinner by fellow inmates, he was ostracized, facing such severe threats in the Drumheller Penitentiary's kitchen that he stopped eating there, leading to significant weight loss. Guys were spitting in his food or threatening him, etc. Otto Sauter from the John Howard Society noted Gagnon's emaciated state in 1975, pointing out his isolation and lack of support. So this is a year after the events. Uh, somebody was opining on what might have led to this guy's behavior. Is it bad that out of all of what you just read, I'm sitting here thinking maybe a stint in jail would help me to finally lose some weight? <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> well, you know, you got to do what you got to do, <laughs> but don't hurt anybody. If you're going to go to jail, don't do something that hurts anyone. No, no. Maybe some property crime. I don't know, Matthew. <laughs> I'm way too old and boring and straight-laced to go to jail. Did you say straight? Straight-laced. Okay. <laughs> Released on June 23rd, 1974, Gagnon's life outside of prison wasn't much better. He moved between jobs with colleagues, consistently describing him as a solitary figure, often seen alone laughing to himself for reasons unknown. He was under a supervision order that ended on November 12th, 1974, only three days before he moved into the garage. At some point, he'd gotten a tattoo, born to lose, but out to win. Uh, born to lose, out to win. That kind of says, says it all, doesn't it? It is gross. Oh, it's just, oh, you know, you could, everyone has like a third distant cousin on Facebook that, that posts shit like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Constable Gregor Ash was inside the store listening to Rose's story about what had just happened when Philippe Gagnon entered. When Gregor Ash asked Gagnon to come outside and hop into his patrol car to have a chat, according to Mike DeMore's article at Western Standard, Gagnon responded, quote, No way I'm getting into your fucking police car. I'm going home. End quote. Gagnon fled, and Gregor Ash took off after him, hopping into his patrol car to give chase. 
Seeing that this was not just a routine call, Gregorash radioed for backup as he took off after Gagnon. Gregorash lost sight of his suspect, but a neighbor pointed the officer toward the house on 9th Street Southeast, saying he had watched the running man enter through the door to the garage. Constable Gregorash approached the door and knocked, but got no response from within. The officer decided to wait for backup before trying to enter the house, and CPS Constables Tom Dick and Mel Lynn arrived on the scene quickly. Sergeant Ben Robinson arrived sometime after. The officers formulated a quick plan and approached the garage. Each went to different doors in the window. Constable Dick opened the window and said, Come on out. Oh, we just want to talk to you. And Gagnon screamed back, I'm not coming out. You come in and get me. I guess that sounded like an invitation to them. So Constable Lynn went in through one door while Constable Dick climbed in through the window and unlocked a second door so Gregor Ash could enter. Oh, God. They have, you know, you're, you're, we're going through this and I know the rest of the story. And it's just like they have no idea how dramatically this is going to escalate right you're right the poor cops like they just think they're chasing some guy addicted to glue sniffing right right no clue what's about to happen so inside they split up and looked around in the dark and sweet for their suspect constable lynn was the first officer to encounter gagnon who was inhaling glue from a bag while holding a rifle a 22 caliber gagnon aimed the rifle at lynn pulled the trigger but it misfired Lynn alerted the others that their suspect had a gun and took cover. Gagnon then aimed at Constable Dick, but again the rifle misfired. Dick fired four shots at Gagnon and hid behind a fridge while Gregorash took cover behind a table. All those shots missed. Gregorash called out to dispatch via his walkie-talkie to let them know that their suspect was armed with a rifle and firing at them. As Gregorash yelled, We just want to talk, Gagnon shot again hitting the table and injuring Gregorash as the bullet ricocheted and grazed his temple. In a documentary about the events on Calgary Police's YouTube channel, geared at young people, Youth Link YYC, Gregorash recounted his shooting. Quote, All of a sudden I could see him, he's got the rifle at me. You know, it was hard to explain, but you didn't hear the bang, didn't hear nothing. All you could see was a puff of smoke. End quote. Last week I was reading an article about how time seems to slow down when you're in danger. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it was fascinating. Uh, I'd, I'd never actually re- read up on it before. So it, it, essentially this sort of an increased attention to time makes it pass mm-hmm. more slowly. So when you're in danger and your brain is aroused, it, it actually begins to increase its rate of neural pulses. Okay. So that you see things more slowly. Interesting. In order for you to be able to respond to it, it's fascinating stuff. And maybe that's what was happening with him. Like the idea of, you know, he he didn't hear the bang, but I just picture the smoke slowly going from the gun. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. Knowing they were outgunned by a man who was clearly willing to fire on them, the officers quickly realized escape was their best hope for survival. Dick yelled, get the hell out. And the three cops made their way out of the garage. Gagnon fired after them as they ran toward their patrol cars for cover, hitting Dick in the rear end. The low-caliber round didn't do as much damage as it could have as the bullet slammed into the wallet the officer kept in his back pocket. The three officers took cover behind their vehicles, urgently calling for support as Gagnon secured the door, barricading himself inside the garage. Police and ambulances rapidly converged on the area, with officers from across Calgary responding, some without official orders. An officer warned curious neighbors to stay indoors for safety. One of those who later recalled the day's events to the Calgary Herald was neighbor Ann Choma. She was hanging out her laundry when the whole fracas started and was shocked to see police cars screaming down the back lane and coming to a stop behind her house with armed officers swarming toward the house just across the way. Police set up a perimeter, evacuating those not in immediate danger, while families sought shelter behind parked cars and other places. Inside the garage, Gagnon fired randomly at police through the walls, armed with modified guns and surrounded by ammunition. Detective Boyd Davidson, a respected 43-year-old arson unit officer and father of five, was one of the first on the scene with his trusty shotgun. Davidson was a bear of a man with a kind personality. Everyone liked him, even some of the people he'd convicted during his 23-year career with the CPS, 
He was known to follow up with those recently released from incarceration, wanting to ensure they could get along well on the outside. Davidson's fellow officers remembered him in the Youth Link YYC documentary. To paraphrase, Boyd had a legendary status at the CPS. Despite not being exceptionally tall, he was robust, weighing 320 pounds. His unique way of forcefully breaking down doors was impressive. Unlike others who would use their foot, Boyd would charge with his broad chest, causing the door to shatter. His quickness was remarkable for someone of his build. Boyd's physical presence, combined with his warm smile and a twinkle in his eye, made him an ideal candidate for playing Santa Claus in the office. He was always ready to lend a hand in any situation. His commitment to policing was profound, often being the first to respond with a shotgun in critical situations. This was no exception. Boyd was more than just an effective detective. He was a genuinely excellent and kind-hearted individual. He was, to his colleagues and everybody else who knew him, an all-around great guy. Yeah, I'm looking at the the photo of him right now, and mm-hmm. he looks jolly. He looks like a great guy. He's like a big old, big old lug with a big smile. And you're right, total little twinkle in his eye there. A big old bear of a guy. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it reminds me of uh, people who m- mom and dad sort of hung around with back in the day, and I remember those that kind of guy. Me too, and he's kind of wearing the tie because it's the 70s, right? So you can totally picture sort of when you were a child, you know, this is kind of the look of some people, right? From inside the garage, Gagnon continued firing on those he'd pinned down and other arriving officers. Unknown to the cops at the time, as well as his 22 caliber semi-automatic rifle, he also had a .30-06, a high-caliber hunting rifle that could do a lot more damage. He had scores of boxes of ammunition for both, each of which he'd converted to fire as fully automatic, essentially making both of them machine guns. The officers fired back at the garage, but their 38 special sidearms were utterly ineffective against the garage walls. Detective Davidson joined the other officers in returning fire, intermittently popping up from his position behind a patrol car and firing his shotgun toward the building. The decision was made to introduce tear gas into the garage, hoping it would daze or better yet, dislodge Gagnon from his hiding place. Detective Davidson volunteered to shoot the glass out of the windows with buckshot from his shotgun to give better access to the gas grenades. He set about doing so and was successful, but only seconds after taking shelter behind a nearby structure, a high-caliber round smashed through the structure and into Boyd Davidson's throat, wounding him fatally. As medical assistance was provided to their downed comrade, now even more determined, the other CPS officers ineffectually poured round after round into the garage. Tear gas went in, also seeming to have no effect. It didn't make sense. Gagnon's bullets just kept slamming into the buildings and cars police and civilians were using for shelter. Scores of officers were desperate to end the siege, but had been pinned down by just one man. The officers on scene called dispatch for more firepower and begged for more ammunition as they ran low. More after a quick break. Hey Dark Poutine listeners, Mike here. Are you ready to dive deep into the mysteries of the supernatural? Join me and award-winning paranormal researcher Morgan Knudsen as we dissect chilling phenomena on supernatural circumstances. From spine-tingling hauntings to creepy cryptids and other paranormal subjects, we'll be your guides on this extraordinary journey. We're in Season 2 right now, so there are plenty of episodes for you to catch up on. Buckle up and explore the unknown with us and numerous expert guests. Download Supernatural Circumstances wherever you podcast. If you're looking for a smoking gun, I can absolutely guarantee you, you will not find it. In October 2001, a series of letters filled with a deadly powder called anthrax were dropped into the U.S. mail system. What started as an unprecedented case turned into an unsettling mystery. Who sent these deadly letters and why? From Campside Media and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm Josh Dean, and this is Cover Up Season 4, The Anthrax Threat. Available now. 
Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. And we are back. Matthew, thoughts so far? I think what strikes me most is is how something is so small and maybe relatively routine for the police escalated so quickly. Right. Right? I mean, by no fault of their own, these poor cops were totally caught off guard. And um, it was 1974. They didn't expect for this kind of thing. They probably didn't plan for that at all. So so it's why that this case ends up leading to better planning and training. Yeah. And, you know, this stuff didn't really happen back then. Yeah. And, you know, and what made it so tragic is it's just this, you know, chasing this glue sniffing guy over a relatively small thing. And it ends up with uh, a great person uh, who's lost his life and other people hurt, right? It's, and it's sad even after all this time when you, when you listen to the story. The racket was terrifying, not only for the first responders, but for the residents in the Grandview neighborhood. The sounds of gunfire could be heard for blocks. It was like living in a war zone. Many of the residents took shelter in their basements to avoid the bullets whizzing around with no care for who they hit. Even reporters and officers at a temporary base set up 200 meters away had to dive for cover more than once as one of Gagnon's rounds whistled by perilously close. It was a miracle that no civilians were injured or killed. What is now called Ramsey is a neighborhood situated in Calgary's southeast quadrant. It's an inner city area positioned east of the Elbow River, McLeod Trail, Stampede Grounds, and the Scotiabank Saddle Dome and south of Inglewood. The neighborhood also shares its southern border with the Aleth Bonnie Brook Industrial Zone. Predominantly featuring older homes, the eastern section of Ramsey also includes an industrial zone in its far eastern part. Ramsey was initially developed in the 1880s by Wesley Fletcher Orr and his associates. The community received its name in 1956 following the amalgamation of Burnsland, Brewery Flats, Grandview, and Mills Estate areas into a single community. It was named in honor of William Thompson Ramsey, a notable early land agent and property owner in the area. Ramsey is represented in the Calgary City Council by the councillor of Ward 9 and has an established area redevelopment plan. Have you spent much time in Calgary? I have. I've spent uh, a bit of time there, yeah. Yeah, I, I spent quite a bit when I was doing consulting for uh, Theatre Calgary. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I was really surprised. Like the quality of the art scene alone in that city, in my opinion, is is really unexpected for the size. They have the theater, the Philharmonic, art galleries. It's it's actually a really nice city. Calgary uh, proper is really spread out. You know, like the the whole the area is very spread out, and that's what I found. Like there's a lot of highway driving in mm. Calgary to get from place to place. If you've got, you know, a relative you're going to see in one area and you're in another, there's there's lots and lots of highway driving, even just to go to the mall. I was hung up sort of downtown. Downtown. Yeah. Okay. At the time of the shootout, according to folks who lived there, the neighborhood was a little run down, but was full of kind people. It was a tight community and has since made a comeback. The cops and neighbors weren't the only ones sheltering. Inside the garage, Gagnon was hiding inside a pit six feet deep in the concrete floor of the garage, essentially a fortress making him impervious to police gunfire no matter the caliber and sheltering him from tear gas. Police were made aware of the pit after an hour of almost continual gunfire. Mario Argento, who lived in another part of the home, drew them a map of the garage's interior indicating the position of the pit, created years earlier for the installation of a furnace that was never put into place. The Calgary police knew they had to do something extreme. Rather than endanger any more officers trying to storm the house, 
they decided to call the military at CFB Calgary to supply them with an armored personnel carrier to assist. You know, for a minute, I thought the pit was going to be one of those uh, grease pits, I think they're called, for, for working on cars. We did actually do an episode way back in episode 40 about the Cook family massacre, also in Alberta, and it was the last person hanged there. The reason that stands out to me is because the killer stuffed bodies into the grease pit in the garage Ugh. of the house. So that's where they were discovered. Over the course of the siege, as well as Boyd Davidson's death, several officers were hurt. The injured officers, according to the Calgary Herald the day after the shootout, were Constable Joseph George Sylvester, 42, wounded in the throat, Detective Nick Graham, 45, with a head wound, and Robert John Barrett, 27, was wounded in the hand. Three more constables were nursing minor injuries. Thomas Robert Dick was shot in the buttocks, mentioned above. William Standage, 27, had a shoulder wound. And Harvey Kenneth Gregorash, the initial responding officer, had a head wound from a bullet graze. Still others were hit by shrapnel, flying grass from shut-out car windows, or splinters from rounds shot through walls. Nick Graham's dramatic injury was recounted in the YouthLink YYC documentary by a few of the officers there that day. Near the beginning of the siege, right after another officer's bulletproof vest saved his life, Nick Graham was shot. Nick Graham was seen rushing toward a police car, left by the initial responding officers. Other officers, fearing for his safety, urged him not to proceed. Graham ignored the warnings and moved forward. However, as he approached, the assailant fired, striking Nick in the head and causing a significant injury, indicated by a burst of blood hanging briefly in the cold afternoon air. Onlookers feared the worst, believing he had been fatally wounded. Sergeant Robinson quickly moved to protect Graham, desperately urging him not to succumb to his injuries. Despite the grave situation and the apparent danger, Robinson remained determined to save Graham, repeatedly imploring him to stay with him. The scene was deeply distressing, yet amid the chaos, there was a glimmer of hope as Graham, known for his resilience, ultimately survived the incident, living to an old age. His survival was almost miraculous, especially considering the severity of the attack. One of Graham's fellow officers quipped that as Graham was a hard-headed Irishman, the head was most likely the best place to shoot him. According to the Calgary Herald, quote, Desperate officers tried the bullhorn again. Come out, son. Come on out, and you won't be hurt, and you'll be out in time for Christmas. I got another one of you, you fucking pigs, Gagnon answered. Also in the documentary, Constable Sylvester recalled his own shooting. He said, quote, I got hit in the neck. I knew that I was going to the ground, and when I saw the blood, I was worried. I thought, oh, shit. Roy came over at that particular time, and I said, you know, get a pad, get something, and put it on this hole while, you know, he couldn't find anything. So I told him to stick his finger in the hole and keep it there until we were able to get out, and he probably saved my life. I suppose one would say that God was looking down on me that day, end quote. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. He's going to die, so the other guy just sticks his, the finger in, into the wound? Yeah. That's desperation, man. Well, I mean, I would do it. Yeah, absolutely. But it's just like, he, he, the guy sounds, he, he could have so easily have died that day. Yeah, get shot in the throat isn't uh, isn't exactly... Not uh, recommended. Not recommended. By most physicians. Right. <laughs> also, according to the Calgary Herald, paramedics heroically ventured into the fray to evacuate the injured, shielded by police officers who provided covering fire. Ambulances shuttled continuously between the scene and the hospital. At Calgary General's emergency room, staff stayed updated through radio news, querying paramedics about the ongoing shootout. The situation escalated as more officers, many unsolicited, converged on the garage equipped with an array of firearms and shields they sought cover behind various objects. An hour into the conflict, Gagnon had effectively immobilized over a hundred police officers, complicating communication and coordination due to the sheer number of personnel and the constant gunfire. Calgary residents were shocked to see a gaggle of police cars escorting a Canadian Forces armored personnel carrier through the city streets that afternoon. It was 3.40 p.m., more than two hours after the shooting had started. 
when the troop carrier, driven by a young soldier named Frank Lillies, rumbled up and made a hard right turn into the gravel driveway of the home at the center of the showdown between the CPS and the glue-crazed gunman. This is just incredible. Right. I'm just picturing this scene in my head, and it went from zero to 100 in a few hours, and it's it's a war zone at this point. They have, like, essentially a tank there, right? Mm -hmm. And what's interesting, I didn't put it into the script, but uh, Lily's, the guy who was driving the armored car, right? uh, later that year, left the military and joined the Calgary Police Service. I guess he enjoyed his his time with them so much that he thought uh, i'll leave the military and be a cop he's like great i get to drive the tank in calgary i don't have to go abroad <laughs> right exactly from the vancouver sun quote the powerful vehicle drove to the edge of the yard with three soldiers from the princess patricia's canadian light infantry inside hey army gagnon greeted them gleefully come on army The soldiers discussed various ways to use the vehicle before deciding the direct route was the best. Lily's was directed to drive into the garage, which he did. As the heavy-tracked armored vehicle hit the building, the whole house shuddered. Lily was told to hit it again, and he reversed and went in hard, right through the garage, again and again and again, decimating the garage. Doug Bolton said it was, quote, just like a rearing horse, The wheels were spinning, there was wood flying, there were shingles flying, and it just blew the whole corner right out of that garage, end quote. At this point, Tom Barrow, later promoted to staff sergeant, had not fired a shot. He said in the later documentary, quote, I had my gun out, and I get down on one knee, and I'm braced beside the building, and I look up, and I could see the door move, and I could just barely see that door move, and I shouted to the guys, I shouted something about, he's coming out, he's coming out, get ready. End quote. When Philippe Gagnon exited the garage, he was still armed with a rifle in each of his hands, firing toward the waiting officers. Doug Bolton let loose with a shotgun blast, hitting Gagnon. Other officers opened fire at the same time. Tom Barrow recalled, quote, It just stood the man right up straight, and he froze in midair for a second, and I was able to squeeze gently, squeeze one shot off. And you know, my emotions were unbelievable. I was flat. There was no feeling, there was no fear, there was no nerves, I was just flat, end quote. Philippe Gagnon was shot 23 times by various officers' firearms. He died almost instantly. When the smoke cleared, it was determined that 98 officers had fired more than 500 rounds into the garage. All the officers who were not too severely injured, including Gregorash, returned to work the next day. Jim Bergen likened his fellow officers to John Wayne. They were stoic, and no one talked about what happened in Ramsey five days before Christmas in 1974 after that. The city mourned with Boyd Davidson's family. More than 200 first responders from all over Canada were at his funeral despite the biggest family holiday of the year. Many considered supporting a fallen comrade's family a top priority. Most law enforcement families understood this. A commission was struck to investigate the failures at the shootout, which more than a few officers thought was a shit show from the word go. Calls for improvements to the CPS's training and response to dangerous calls were implemented. Soon after, the code for a call involving firearms was was now called Code 300, and specific training, equipment, and expectations around those calls were created and implemented, including creating the CPS tactical team. Today, CPS boasts one of the country's most highly trained and respected tactical units. According to their website, the Calgary Police Service's tactical unit is a highly specialized team that responds to high-risk incidents, particularly those involving weapons or situations beyond the scope of standard patrol response. Like SWAT teams and other police agencies, such as the RCMP's Emergency Response Team and the Toronto Police Service's Emergency Task Force, The tactical unit performs equivalent functions. The unit is frequently deployed in various high-risk scenarios, including weapon-related incidents, executing search warrants, and supporting frontline patrol officers. Annually, they respond to approximately 1,000 calls for service. Their training covers a wide range of situations, including warrant execution, hostage rescue, high-angle operations, explosive forced entry, and explosive disposal. 
The unit also cross-trains with other agencies, including the FBI, the Canadian and American military, LAPD SWAT, and others to continually enhance their capabilities. You know, teams like this are are good to have, but um, we don't want situations where they're needed. Right. Yeah. And it's like a thousand calls yearly. I guess there's a lot of uh, search warrants and those kind of things that are being executed. I can't imagine what what they're doing for a thousand calls. We'd be hearing a lot if it was this exciting. Well, there's that trend of swatting people. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Well, there is that. I don't think that happened here, though. I don't think they publicize it if it happens here. Being part of the tactical unit is both challenging and rewarding. New members undergo a rigorous six-month basic tactical operations course covering over 40 specialty areas and are evaluated on their knowledge. After completing the BTOC, they are assigned to a team and undergo a six-month probation during which they must attend a certain number of high-risk calls and warrant executions. Completing this probationary period earns them an operator insignia and a unique number marking their place in the unit. Members must also commit to ongoing training and be available on call as needed. As we mentioned, a number of the officers involved that day told their story in the documentary on the Youth Link YYC YouTube channel. I highly recommend it. It made my eyes wet seeing and hearing these guys recall Detective Boyd and their feelings of that day, which still haunts some of them almost 50 years later. Tom Barrow candidly shared a moment with his wife in the immediate aftermath of the shootout. Tom said, quote, I saw my wife's car coming into the driveway. I can remember walking through the kitchen into the entryway, and she come in, and she looked at me. You okay? Oh, yeah, I'm okay. Not to worry. I'm okay. And she came up the stairs, and I grabbed her, and the two of us stood there and cried and cried and cried. We figured that was the end for us, end quote. So, so you, you sent me that link to the, the doc last night. I've watched a bit of it. And yeah. You just said now you, you, got, a, you got a little bit teary. So what, uh, what affected you? Well, what affected me was how it humanized these older gentlemen. And, you know, like I said, it's 50 years later, and some of them are still haunted by what, what went on that day and how yeah. horrific it was and, and how scared they were. And obviously, Tom Barrow relates a bit of it. You know, he's this yeah. tough, gruff cop in 1974, and he's crying on his stairwell with his wife, you know? Yeah. It was a real candid moment, and they these guys were very honest, and it's just a fantastic documentary. If you don't watch it, you're missing out, so it'll be in the show notes. Since the death of Detective Boyd Davidson on December 20th, 1974, the Calgary Police Service has mourned the loss of several officers in the line of duty. The most recent was Sergeant Andrew Harnett, who was killed during a New Year's Eve traffic stop in 2020, marking him as the 12th officer to die while serving the CPS. Sergeant Harnett was dragged over 400 meters after stopping a car. The driver, who was 17 years old at the time, thus cannot be publicly identified, claimed during trial that he accelerated because he was frightened after seeing Harnett reaching for his gun. The prosecution had sought an adult sentence of 11 to 13 years, noting that the driver was only 11 days shy of turning 18 when the crime occurred. The defense had argued for a shorter sentence of seven and a half years minus time already served. The young man was subsequently sentenced to 12 years in prison with credit for time served. Harnett's death came after a series of tragic losses for the service. Constable Darren Beatty was critically injured in 2001 during a training exercise. In 2000, Constable John Petropoulos died after falling through a false ceiling while investigating a break-in. Constable Rick Sonnenberg was killed in 1993 while attempting to deploy a spike belt to stop a stolen vehicle. And in 1992, Constable Rob Vanderweel was fatally shot during a traffic stop. Earlier in 1977, Constable Bill Shelliver was shot in the head while confronting an armed robbery suspect. Staff Sergeant Keith Harrison died in 1976 following a shootout with holdup suspects. Before these incidents, Constable Ken Delmage died in 1957 following a motorcycle collision. Constable Wilf Cox was killed in a motorcycle accident in 1941. Inspector Joe Carruthers was shot by a burglary suspect in 1933, and Constable Arthur Duncan was fatally shot in 1917 during a recovery operation. 
Each of these losses highlights the dangers that police officers face in the line of duty. We get a lot of stories in the news when there are bad cops who do bad things. And, right. And rightfully so, because they're in, they're in positions of power. They can arrest. They, they can shoot a gun. So spotlighting is important for society. But we can't lose uh, sight of the balance that the majority of cops out there are actually very good cops who are there to protect and serve and take take their job seriously. And, and you know, just to be thankful and show respect for for the the ones that are doing this tough job and the people that you know they're human beings that you know literally in the, in the line of fire for us on a daily basis right i know a lot of police officers i grew up with uh, a couple of guys who are rcmp and have been in other uh agencies and and that whole thing that people say all cops are bastards like come on get over yourselves it's just not like, true like you, it you, isn't you know, true I've, I've shared on the show i have family members who are it's 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 bigotry yeah is what it is it's yeah. just somebody being bigoted and and small-minded once yeah. again yeah and the world's got enough bigotry right now especially but uh yeah it's it's <laughs> uh, yeah why don't we hear more stories of these folks i mean among other awards given to CPS officers, the Boyd Davidson Memorial Award Award is presented in memory of the detective killed in the line of duty in 1974, recognizing an outstanding act of courage and heroism, and it was presented for the first time in 1998. So I don't know of anybody who's received that. So why isn't that reported? Why aren't there more reports about Cops who've done good things are being recognized for it, and that kind of thing. Maybe you, uh, you know, you know the old saying: "If it bleeds, it leads." Right. Well, maybe it did bleed. Maybe they did bleed to receive yes. this award. So, so therefore, it should lead, right? <laughs> right, but it doesn't, yeah. which is interesting. Mm. And that's it for Dark Poutine episode two hundred and ninety-five: The Black Friday Siege, the murder of Detective Boyd Davidson. So, thoughts? <laughs> oh boy, that was that was, a, that was a wild ride. That was a real wild ride. Yeah, I can't, I, I can't even begin to fathom. You, you sent, you, know? you sent the script to me last night. <laughs> yeah, and I was reading it on my phone while I was supposed to be watching a movie with with my husband, and I, and he, he kept on shushing me because I'm like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yep. It way. It all way. happened. Yeah. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at one 327 5786 or one 827 darkptn We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. So we have one voicemail this week, and let's take a listen. Hello. Uh, I'm just calling because... You guys actually covered one of my extended family members in one of your episodes. It was the Niagara Falls episode, um, where he was one of the guys who jumped over but survived. Um, I thought it was really interesting hearing such a – just seeing them show up on your podcast. I thought that was cool and very interesting. Um, love the show. Love everything. Hope everyone's doing great. Uh can't wait for the new episodes. Just got through all the Halloween ones. Those are fantastic. Love the cryptids. And uh, go take a big shit in your hat. Thank you. Well, he didn't name himself. He which, didn't. Which I would have loved because I would love to know who it was who ended up going <laughs> over and, and lived to tell this tale. Call, uh, us, call us back uh, and, and, and tell us next week. Yeah, but what, what do you think that person does for a living near Niagara Falls Clearly, they're near. I think. At least. I think he took his uh, aunt or uncle's um, lunacy seriously, and mm -hmm. and thought never again, and actually patrols uh, people to stop them from going over Niagara Falls. Well, that's probably a really good thing. He's kept it so, in the family, but just the, just the other side, you know. Well, thank you for doing that. We appreciate your service, and we appreciate you listening and calling in. Yes. We definitely do. That's it for this week's voicemails. 
Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 877 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. All righty, uh, and we have uh, a patron this week, and her name is Lisa Windsor, Lisa Windsor, and I don't know where Lisa is from or what she does for a living, Matthew, so we need to figure that out. So <clears throat> Lisa uh, is actually named from, of the, from the city she's in, so uh, Windsor, okay. Windsor, Ontario. Win- Windsor, Ontario, not yep. Windsor, Nova Scotia. No, and not not Windsor, UK. Okay. And uh, she does micro engraving on diamonds. So, okay. so you know, you know, dear Alice, uh, this represents my internal love. She does it, so you have to. You can, she's really small, so you can only see it with a magnifying glass. Or go shit in your hat. Yeah, or or a little. Could you imagine a diamond ring that has a little microscopic go shit in your hat on it? <laughs> Fantastic. Really well, thank you so much, Lisa, and enjoy your engravings. I hope she does like little emojis and stuff like that too. Well, she's the- more she's more of a classicist when it comes that way, but you know, more and gotcha. more people have been asking for it, so you know, she's considering doing it. Well, there you go. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, well. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us Donut Money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening, and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. So there you go. Yeah, where do I where do I get you know, I just make that crap up most of the time with people's jobs. Like I'm I was sitting here while while we're listening to that going on the spot I came up with micro diamond engraver. And I'm and I was trying to go through like my my the it my in my head how I got to that. It's just very weird. Well, don't bother <laughs> going through it in your head because I mean, you know, your mind will blow up. <laughs> That's how creativity works. You just do it. My yeah. my head is a dangerous neighborhood. I tend not to go in there. I might get mugged. Well, yeah, I can't go in there alone. Yeah, someone's <laughs> always always there after my milk money. That's it for this episode of Dark Poutine. So until next time, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. See y'all later. Bye. <laughs> Hi, it's Shauna, and I might be a bad parent because my kids think french fries are vegetables. Hey, it's Ryan, and I might be a bad parent because I went out for wings when my wife was in the hospital after giving birth. Johnny here. I might be a bad parent because in my house, the tooth fairy gives pocket change. But we're not alone. Len emailed us and said his six-year-old daughter's Tarzan moment going from love seat to lazy boy by curtains made him more proud than any dance <laughs> recital. <laughs> and Andy left his two-year-old at the rink. All right, guys, I'm sure we're not alone, like Andy's kid. For stories and confessions like this, make sure you check out our podcast. It's called Bad Parents, and it's available wherever you get your podcasts. I left a glove at the rink.